Praise be to God. Joining us right now is Edward Penton, uh, coming to us via phone from Rome. He is with National Catholic Register. We've had him on several times in the past. Praise be to God. He's got a couple of stories out we want to jump into. Good morning to you, Edward Penton. Good morning, sir. Thank you for your time today. Uh, you have a, an article out on, uh, the headline goes, Traditional Catholics' fears lessened with papal decree, but questions remain. And so this was uh, a kind of a surprise to a lot of traditional Catholics. I go to an FSSP parish, and so we were pleasantly surprised at this news, but we wonder what it, what it means. So tell us what happened in this recent meeting between the FSSP and His Holiness Pope Francis. Right. Well, it dates back to Traditionis Custodes, which was the motu proprio that the Pope uh, issued last July, which um, is put severe restrictions on on the traditional mass, the traditional sacraments, and there was no distinction made really between uh, traditional priests and communities. And so, the traditional communities, like the FSSP, uh, were under the impression that it also applied to them. Though there was never any clear uh, anything clear clearly said about that. Um, so what this um, what this development said was uh, after a meeting between two priests from the FSSP with uh, the Pope on uh, earlier this month, is that um, they discussed the, uh, whether these uh, restrictions did apply to them. Uh, the Pope said that uh, traditionis custodis did not apply to them, and that um, they are free to continue to use the liturgical books of 1962. So in other words, they could still continue celebrating the sacraments as before. Um, uh, he said the provisions uh, should be respected in traditionis custodis, but he did say that nevertheless, the major proprio did not apply to them. And so they asked for, the, for this to be made put in writing, and sure enough, the Pope uh, issued a decree um, which was published by the uh, fraternity, the priestly fraternity of St. Peter, and uh, so that gave them the, the definitive uh, decision from the Pope that these that um, they could continue basically as as before, but it only applies to the FSSP, and uh, we haven't actually had a sort of uh, official Vatican um, confirmation of this decree. We've only had it from the FSSP, so there's, there's questions remaining. That's just a few of them. Edward, I'm I'm wondering here that when the news broke, we saw uh, you know the article come out and. It was two French priests, but not the superior general of the of the FSSP. Do we have any idea as to why that was? I think that was, um, I think partly because I believe one of the priests is friends with uh, a cardinal who brokered this meeting, which is Cardinal Philippe Barberin. Um, he is the full archbishop of, of Lyon in France. Um, and so that was partly why he came. I think it was also because they thought it was better if a sort of more junior priest went rather than uh, the superior general. Um, and so that's what happened. So there, those two went instead. Uh, but um, yes, and that, that's, how it, that's how it came about. They, they requested this meeting with the Pope, and the Pope obviously uh, agreed to it. You know, Edward, it was uh, very interesting to me when this came out. Uh, people were celebrating, and uh, praise be to God, but at the same time, a lot of people, and myself included, were very skeptical of this uh, very, this action. I mean, it seems very contrary to a lot of the other things that the Holy Father has said. And so I, I pray and hope that it turns out to be the solution that many people uh, think it is and that it firstly appears to be. But my concern is that nowhere in the document uh, that is said, like, for, well, for one, like you said, uh, their document is not for public uh, – it's not – publicly given out by the Vatican yet. You can't find it on the Vatican website. So that's one concern. The other concern is that nowhere in it does it say that they can celebrate it exclusively or without further conditions or restrictions. It simply says they have the right to say it. Uh, and they, and they, if they continue saying the Mass, they can only say it in their own parishes. They can't say it elsewhere. And they are to, quote, as far as possible, the provisions of the motu proprio are to be taken into account. Uh, so how would you respond to these kind of concerns? Should we uh, this alleviate all of our fears, or should we be on the lookout? Well, there's a lot of unknowns, and I, I, I had comments from the Superior General, Father Komorowski of the FSSB, and he he's also un, unaware of exactly how this is going to work out. Um, I think they're just waiting and seeing uh, how or whether the, the Vatican's going to still impose certain restrictions, as you say, or whether... <clears throat> or whether they can 
as I said earlier, be, be free to celebrate as before. So it, there are a lot of unknowns, and it's really, um, we'll know, I think, more when this predicted document comes out, which is from the Congregation for Religious. Um, we know that there is some document in the works from them, um, but uh, I understand that they're rather upset about this because um, they were not expecting uh, the Pope to do this, and I think also Archbishop Roach of the Congregation for Religious, who, who in an interview with the Register that I, I did with him, he said that uh, that they were uh, con- they, 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 they basically the right of ordination in the old right was no longer valid; it was no longer allowed, rather, um, under the, the that responsa, which was a sort of an application document that was issued in December. So, so there. Those two congregations, I think, are feeling a little, perhaps a bit undercut um, by this announcement by the Pope. And we may see in this upcoming document by the Congregation for Religious some sort of um, further clearer definitions of exactly what this decree means and what it means also for the other institutes. I want to ask about that again as a follow-up, the other institutes, because you said a, a minute ago that it only applied to the FSSP or this personal decree from His Holiness to the FSSP. Uh, I want to say that uh, I read a statement from the FSSP that they thought it would apply to the others, the Institute of Christ the King or Institute du Bon Pasteur. I mean, so how will that roll out? Do you think it will apply, or do you think they also have to make the trip to Rome to visit His Holiness? Well, this is this is another big question because, yes, you're right, the FSSP does think it applies to the others, at least they imply it does. Um, but uh, the decree itself only speaks about the FSSP. And so and from a legal point of view, um, it's whatever's in the decree that, that really carries carries weight. So, um, again, we're going to have to see just whether it does apply to the others. Um, I think certainly other institutes are going to be keen that, that it does, and they're going to possibly be pushing for that. Um, but, uh, again, it's, it's hard to say. But, of course, throughout this, it's been rather... Um, I think the, the criticism has been it's been really not well handled at all for the traditional institutes. I mean, it's been seven months since Traditionis Custodius came out, came out, and they've been kind of in the dark for all that time. They don't know; they've not known whether these these rules apply to them. And in fact, in the Diocese of Rome here, they they were effectively banned from six of the seven sacraments, so the traditional sacraments, from celebrating them um, because of a, a document that the uh, Diocese of Rome put out uh, in October, and that seemed to apply to, across the board to all of the traditional institutes and priests. Um, so, so since then, they've they've not been celebrating all of the sacraments in the in the fraternity parish here. Um, but now this this document comes out and and most probably overrides it. So, so there's a lot of confusion and a lot of um, uh, ways I think people thought this could have been handled better. Do you think it's possible, we're up against a break here in just a minute, but do you think it's possible that because the Vatican hasn't released this personal decree yet publicly, the FSSP has their copy, by, I guess, but uh, it's not been released publicly, do you think that the, the uh, Congregation for Divine Worship will just simply pretend as though it didn't happen? Well, I mean, this is one argument, you're right, and the, uh, the fact that they can say, well, you know, the Vatican hasn't said this and it's not... It's not a, it's not sort of legally defined in a sort of formal way that they can sort of get round this. That is certainly a concern. But but again, we're just going to have to see what happens over the next um, the next few weeks. I think. Oh, I wanted to ask you how you thought the bishops will respond to this news. I, I we've been very blessed where I'm at right now. We've, we have a wonderful FSSP community. It's growing. It's busting at the seams. And we enjoy that. We've not had really any pressure here locally, but I know a lot of bishops have been like, oh, you know, what do I do here? They've been on the fence. Some have been heavy-handed. Others have been light. And how do you think the bishops are going to respond to this information? Well, I think a bit like um, how they've been doing it so far. I think some are just ignoring it. Some are are, um, ignoring rather the restrictions and carrying on as before. And some, of course, are not, and, and taking it further and, and applying it to the letter. But I think there's um because the there is questions over the, the canonical aspects of not so much the Traditionis Custodius, but this follow-up document that the Congregation for Divine Worship issued in December about uh, called the Responsa ad dubia, um, which issued further restrictions which weren't really coherent with with Traditionis Custodius, and so undermined their sort of canonical force, uh, or certainly 
cast into doubt uh, some questions regarding the, the canonical force of the, that document. But um, but there's a lot of ambiguities about all of this. And now we've got this new decree, which, which as I said earlier, um, has also some legal uh, questions about it, but um, but it's obviously in favour of the Institute, or at least the FSSP. <clears throat> then you've got um, these questions, which I think... I think bishops will find it kind of weakens the authority of these documents, and so they might feel free simply to carry on as before, or act arbitrarily and 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 uh, follow follow through with these documents as as they've been put out to the letter. So so again, it's it's it, it, there is a certain uh, a lawlessness about this, uh, and that's been criticised before. Um, and I think these these documents, because they weren't actually scrutinized very much by by canonical experts that uh, there are, there are concerns about these documents and just how how um, legally forceful they can be and whether they really um, could be seen through as as uh, seem to be really um, effective and and have that force of law that, that the Pope or those behind them would like them to have you know one of the other things that I foresee as an issue here speaking of the bishops, is the fact that the fraternity does not have any bishops and this assurance from Pope Francis does not promise them a permission to receive ordinations in the 62 Missal, uh, in the 62 Rite. And uh, therefore, who would it be? What bishop will then be allowed to ordain them? Uh, will they be required then to receive ordination in the new rite? But then they say, well, you just have to be ordained in the new rite, and then you get to say the 62 missile for the rest of your stuff. Uh, so how do you know, have any idea of how that will shake out? Well, I think according to that decree, I think it's all the sacraments, including the ordinations, uh, holy orders uh, are included in that. So uh, I, it seems to overrule that uh, the response that I mentioned in December, which seemed to to rule out traditional ordinations. And so, um, again, we're left with a sort of contradictory uh, messages coming from the Vatican. And so, as as the Superior General of the FSSB told me last uh, a couple of days ago, it's just, basically, it's really up to the bishop to decide what he wants to do. And mm -hmm. he seems to be free to choose whichever sort of legal stipulation that's been put out there to to use and and so it's all very arbitrary and it's we're just going to have to see again uh, what the bishops want to do with this um, but they seem quite free to do whatever they like depending on how they interpret these these documents coming out of the Vatican and to shift topics just a little bit um, the, the right before this meeting happened with the fraternity and the Holy Father the Society of St. Pius X had a meeting with the Holy Father, and I'm not sure you did not report on this, and so I don't know how much you would know or not know about it, but I thought I might as well ask. I heard rumor yesterday that there were discussions with the Holy Father and the Society about consecrating new bishops and, and uh, understanding the recognition of the status of some of their members who left their diocese or left religious communities to join the society. Do you know if there's any veracity to those uh, rumors? Well, I've heard uh, various, um, nothing official, of course, but that, that um, the Pope did, did meet the Superior General of the, of the Society of St. Pius X uh, earlier this month, but I've heard nothing more, and I, I don't, nothing official has been put out, and so I can't really add much to that, but I, I do know that there are concerns from the SSPX about this, the consecration of new bishops, um, and it's quite conceivable that they that was discussed if, if that visit did indeed happen, but I'm afraid I can't, I can't confirm any more about that. Let me ask you one last question about this story before we move on. Uh, one of the other things that kind of came up with this, with the reorganization of the CDW was um, the schizophrenia that, at least that's how I'm characterizing it anyway. Uh, you have, it seems like they're singularly focused on the TLM, but the, what about the ordinariate? I mean, that is that now under scrutiny? What about the other rights within the Roman church uh, that are, Giving a, they're getting a pass. Only the TLM gets scrutinized and and uh, suppressed. What is going on there? Any insight, Edward Penton? Yes, it's a good question, and I I don't know quite why the the reasons what the reasons are for that. But I do, I do think a major motivation for this these this sort of uh, restrictions for the traditional mass uh, come from the fact that uh, a lot of the critics of Pope Francis are within those communities and within 
the traditional mass going uh, faithful. And so I think um, these are very much a reaction to that. I, I don't think those criticisms, at least in the Vatican, are seen as coming from these other groups. And so it really is um, a sort of crackdown on that sort of uh, what they see as a sort of schismatic tendencies am among these uh, groups because they're they're criticizing the Pope and not going along with the post conciliar uh, direction that he's taking the church. Um, and so that, that I think is the main reason for this. Yeah. Let's uh, switch topics here. We're talking with Edward Penton from the National Catholic Register. We have about uh, four and a half minutes or so left. And uh, there's another article you put out. It, the headline goes Pontifical Academy for Life Members Support for Assisted Suicide Draws Criticism. Um, what is going on here? Why would members of the Pontifical Academy for Life uh, support assisted suicide? What's the story, Edward Penton? Right. Well, I mean, it's not as though they support it per se, but what they, what these two members were advocating was that they should. There's a there's a refer, there was a call for a referendum in Italy uh, this month uh, for a voluntary euthanasia, and the constitutional court ruled it out. But before then, these two members were were suggesting there are ways in which uh, voluntary euthanasia could be prevented by uh, allowing assisted suicide. And their, their reasoning was, well, if you allow that, then we can, we can focus on, on resisting voluntary euthanasia. Uh, it was a sort of tactic they were trying to use. It's called the imperfect laws principle, where you, you have politicians who vote for abortion up to 16 weeks instead of 24 weeks, and that's seen as a kind of ethical uh, way of trying to reduce abortion and eventually eliminating it, but the critics have argued that this is not possible and it's it's not it cannot be applied in this case because they're both you know, intrinsic evils and they cannot um, it's it's only going to pave the way to to euthanasia and so but these two um, members thought this was a way to go. One of them is a Jesuit who is uh, a form a physician who who teaches moral theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University here in Rome and he. He was um, just putting out this in La Civiltà Cattolica, which is a, the Jesuit uh, journal, at the end of January, uh, saying that this was um, this this should be done, this could be tried, and he thought it could be successful, but but it hasn't been. But the main problem here is that you've had two members of the academy uh, basically supporting this proposal and this this, uh, this 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 tactic, if you like, publicly, and that. Um, that's been the biggest problem with this because sure they might have these views privately but to speak out as one of them did sort of in the in the name of the academy upset the other academy members and they thought this was scandalous and uh, causing scandal are these so members was, uh, are these members yeah. going to continue being members of the pontifical academy for life well that's a good question because they they've kind of reached the statute the statutes were that they're not supposed to say anything that goes contrary to the magisterium, and um, you know, critics say that this certainly does do. So, but uh, I did ask the academy if they were going to sort of impose some sort of sanction on them, but they they, they didn't respond. So, um, but I think uh, after this, I think there'll be pressure from the other members not to do this again and to to work together and to try to you know come to common common positions rather than than putting out these these. These ideas, which they see as, as scandalous and and contrary to the to the purpose of the academy, are they given are they given sort of some free reign here to think outside the box, if you will? I mean, it would seem to me that if you're going to be a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life, your playbook, your rules are simply the church, what the church teaches, what she believes uh, about these issues, and you don't you don't exceed those, or else you shouldn't be a part of the Pontifical Academy of Life. What say you, Edward Penn? Yeah, well, exactly. And I think, um, of course, they wouldn't see it that way. They'd say, well, this is they're, they're trying to support a lesser evil to prevent a greater evil. That was the way they were looking at it. Um, but again, you know, the, the problem here is the fact that they kind of made their musings public. And they, they instead of uh, discussing these, you know, uh, privately, as I said before, and, mm. and trying to come to some sort of conclusion and then coming to a common position publicly, they, they wanted to go out before that and just make these these ideas um, sort of throw them out as a bit of kite flying, I suppose, to see how they would be received. But instead of the better way would have been to just discuss and fight.